If you would take your Bibles, if you would please, and turn to Luke chapter 23, and as you're finding your place there in Luke chapter 23, we'll read verses 39 to 43 here in just a moment, and I want to focus on the fact that the thief was reconciled unto Christ, and so can you. If you are not reconciled unto Christ, today should be the day for your salvation, and I pray it is, as well as those who have already believed in Christ we too can be reconciled. We can be drawn closer to Christ and however you may be away from him. And while you're turning to Luke chapter 23 and finding verse 39, I want you to remember that it's the power of God unto salvation. It's the gospel that does the work. In Romans 1.16, it says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God and the salvation for everyone who believes. But I also want you to remember Luke 9, 26, it says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him. And those are staggering words, folks. Listen to me. If you are not sharing the gospel, then you're ashamed of Christ. You cannot be ashamed of Christ because in the end, Christ would be ashamed of you. Those are serious words. And I want you to notice five things from the text from this one thief. This thief... He feared God. He confessed his own personal sinfulness. He believed in Jesus' sinlessness. And then he called out to Christ, and then he received assurance from Christ. Notice these things from the text. Read with me if you would. I'm reading from the New American Standard in Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 39. We'll hear first of all from the hell-bound thief, and then from the heaven-bound thief, and then Jesus speaks. Luke chapter 23, verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanging there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation and we indeed are suffering justly for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you go to your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these solemn words. And what has been recorded here is for all of us to learn from today and forevermore. I pray that you would help illuminate the truths of this text so that we can see exactly what you have said Practice it and then teach others. We pray in Christ's name, amen. These words were spoken while suffering from asphyxiation. And so for those who are being crucified, one of the main causes of death is the fact that they just simply cannot breathe. Their own weight is crushing their lungs. And so they must push up from the nails, most of the scholars say that those nails were driven in by professional executioners who knew where the main nerves were to go right through the nerve to cause the most amount of pain. They had to press against that in order to get a breath. And so these words that we're reading here are from criminals and from Jesus who made an extreme effort just to be able to say what was said. So let's read it again. One of the criminals who were hanging there was hurling abuse at him. Can you imagine how much hatred you would have to have in your heart to go through so much pain just to grab a breath to continue to hurl abuse? You know, I looked up this word hurl. It's blasphemo. Does that sound familiar? Uh-oh. And as you think about this word blasphemo and you think this is to reproach Christ intentionally to rail at, to revile, to defile the sacred, to slander the sacred, to defame his holy name. And this is what sinners have in their heart. They have a hatred for a holy God because a holy God convicts them of their sin. And you see right here in the middle of the text that this criminal made an effort to be able to continuously hurl abuse at Jesus. And so, hurling abuse, he says, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. How sarcastic. 
And how intentional. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Jesus, remember me. I guarantee you have never put so much effort into saying anything into your life as what this criminal said on the cross. Now, both of these men, to be quite honest, were mocking Jesus all the way through. Matthew chapter 27 records the fact that both of the robbers who had been crucified with him were mocking him. I'll read verses 38 to 44. Matthew 27, 38 and following says... In the time the two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left, and those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? You see what they're saying to Jesus as they're walking by as he's being crucified? How depraved to take the words right out of Jesus' own mouth for which he said and hurl them back at him. He said, save yourself. You're the son of God. Come down from the cross in the same way. Here we go. Listen, the chief priest also, also on the scribes and the elders were mocking him. So everybody is mocking Jesus. Verse 42, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, let him rescue us now. If he delights in him, for he said, I am the son of God. This is all mocking language. In verse 44, the robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him in the same words. So both of the thieves on the cross were engaged in mocking Jesus in the same sarcastic, belittling, blasphemous tone. Their verbal slander was abuse. They're mockingly repeating Jesus, and even worse so, they took Jesus, his his own words. He said this in John 2, 19, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Do you remember those words? Jesus said, destroy this temple. He's talking about his body, but everybody around him, as dull as they were, they thought they were smart, but they were really the dullest people around. They thought he was talking about the temple. But Jesus was speaking figuratively about his body. Destroy this body, and in three days, I will raise it back up again. And so they still don't get it, and they're still mocking him at the point of crucifixion here. It's staggering to see that they don't get it. And even in the same text, the disciples didn't get it until after the resurrection. In John chapter 2, verse 22, it says, this is a little caveat here, kind of inserted into the passage. So when he was raised from the dead, okay? So the context is the disciples are getting it after the resurrection. So when he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Oh, so it takes... Someone being raised from the dead before your very eyes, before you'll believe? May I say to you today, do not be as dull as the disciples were in this text because you don't have that kind of time. Now, Jesus' temple was being destroyed at this very moment on the cross. Not only was he scourged and beaten and bruised, but he was about to die. But this had already been prophesied in such a clear way. In Psalm chapter 16 and verse 10, we have a prophecy of the resurrection. It says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, neither will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. This is as clear as crystal For those who are in Old Testament times, they know that this is talking about the Messiah to come and he will be resurrected. Peter preached from this same text. Paul preached from this same text. Peter spoke these words in Acts chapter 2 verse 20. Five, and then Paul spoke these same words in Acts chapter 13, verse 35. This is how well they would know what this means, that Paul and Peter would quote this same text as a clarification of Christ being the Messiah to come and resurrected. So it clicked for the disciples 
after the resurrection, but for this thief on the cross beside of Jesus, it clicked before Christ died. Aren't you glad? He comprehended that Jesus Christ was the Lord of life before Christ died. So one criminal fell under conviction and responded to the fact that his conscience was accusing him in his guilt and then he repented right there on the cross in the middle of the pain and suffering and agony he was going through. And so the other unrepented thief, the, the unrepentant thief, he kept on mocking Jesus but isn't it pretty cool to see in the text that the repentant thief started mocking him and turned on him? And so the repentant thief said what Pilate had already said, what was recorded in Luke 23, 4. Then Pilate said to the uh, chief priest and to the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. That's exactly what the repentant thief said. This guy's sinless. This guy's sinless. Jesus is sinless. And then... The repentant thief also uh, knew this. Herod knew this. And he said in Luke 23, 15, Behold, no, I see nothing deserving death from him. What evil has this man done? I have found in him no guilt demanding death. And so Pilate and Herod spoke these truths. And the repentant thief on the cross also saw these same things. So the repentant thief is expressing his belief in Jesus Christ, but also he's expressing a belief in the fact that he knows that there is an afterlife. Get this. He knew that there is an afterlife because he asked Jesus to remember him and his kingdom. After we die, remember me. And so this man had a pre-understanding of the fact that there is life after we die. And so we don't really die. Amen. Really? Yes. There's only one life to live and soon will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. Past this world, past this time. Time's going to come to an end and we will be in eternity. And so this is so important to recognize that the law of God is written on our hearts. The fact that it, eternity exists is written on every person's heart, whether they're saved or unsaved. You don't have to get saved to understand that there's an afterlife. You have to know Christ in order to be in the afterlife with Christ. And so the thief, he pleaded for mercy and he expressed his total depravity and complete need for Jesus' divine grace. He knew he was a wretch. He knew he was a sinner and that he would not have even a moment of time to come off of the cross to try and pay for one single sin. So many today feel like that they can justify their sins or either work their sins off and they have a scales and balance means of eternity. I'm better than I am bad and therefore I'm going to glory. How ridiculous is that? How man-made is that to, to ascribe to yourself anything that is good Jesus said, none are good except for God. And so there are no scales and balances that tip your way to get into heaven or not. And the thief knew this on the cross and he pleaded for Christ to take him with him to paradise. And paradise was promised to this thief. Look with me in verse 43 in Luke chapter 23. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Paradiso. Paradise. Well, what is paradise? Paradise was originally understood from the Septuagint that it referred to the Garden of Eden. And paradise here is taking on an even better and more illuminative meaning. And so we'll let Scripture interpret Scripture here for just a moment, okay? Luke chapter 16. Turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 16. And I, I want you to see verse 22 where Abraham's bosom is also the same as paradise. Luke 16, 22 and 23. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. That being the same understanding as paradise. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. So Abraham's bosom. Paradise is Abraham's bosom. It seems that you're going down to paradise here. But turn to 2 Corinthians 12, 4. 
and see that Paul was caught up into the third heaven, which is also called paradise, 2 Corinthians 12, 4. We'll start in verse 3 because Paul is speaking about himself. And I know how such a man, speaking of himself, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a man is not permitted to speak. And so Paul here ascribes to the fact that he himself was taken up into paradise and then in Hebrews 4.14, 4, we see something else about paradise. Jesus went through this region as he was ascending. So this is talking about the ascension in Hebrews 4.14. 4, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, this is the same root idea as paradise, Jesus, the Son of Man, let us hold fast to our confession. So therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, so Jesus passed through this area as well. But more so than this, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7, it clarifies that only overcomers go to paradise. And this is where we're going to lean into today. Revelation chapter 2 verse 7 says this, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, let him who overcomes, I will, but to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So this is exactly where overcomers go. 1 John 5, 4 says, for whatever or whoever is born of God overcomes the world. And so for yourselves, take a good look at your own life and examine yourselves and see to the whether or not you are overcomers. Take the trial that you're faced with or look back in the past history of your life and say, look at these trials and say to yourself, did I overcome them or am I, am I still stuck in them? And you'll see the fact that overcomers are Christians because they overcome these trials by the power of God. You could not have overcome any of that on your own, but God helped you. That's evidence that you're saved. As evidence that you're saved if God has helped you through these trials. You see, God will allow you to be crushed if you are not saved so that you will look up to Christ. But believers are overcomers. And whatever trial, whatever tribulation, whatever comes your way is intended to help you, not to harm you by God. We see this, Genesis 50, 20 in Joseph's life. We see that in Job's life. We are not only allowed but by the gracious, sovereign, loving God brought into situations that are way beyond our ability to navigate, way beyond our strength in order to come out of, God brings us into a situation that we just cannot do it. We cannot see a way forward. He has been demonstrating this truth to us for all of eternity. Look at what he did to Israel. He brought Israel as Pharaoh and his army were chasing them to a sea that they could not cross. But yet he parted the sea. And the same thing for your life. Those of you who are saved, you're overcomers. Paradise is a promise for those who are overcomers. Only Christians go to heaven. So this word paradise, which Jesus uses, is understood in the New Testament as synonymous for heaven. It's synonymous for God's dwelling place. It's synonymous for where you go when you die if you are a believer and you have been saved by Jesus Christ. Turn to Revelation 21. I want to read eight verses to you because this idea of paradise that the Old Testament Hebrews understood to be referring to the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2, 8 now is restored after the fall and we are going to be enjoyers of paradise once again, a remade paradise, a new heaven. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 8. This is important. Listen. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, 
New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men and he will dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne, behold, I am making all things new. And he said, right, for these words are faithful and true. And then he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. He who overcomes, you see this, right? He who overcomes will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. For the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the immoral persons and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars, their part will be in a lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We are overcomers, and along the way, we're courageous. Someone who has studied the Bible all the way through has said that the Bible says that we have been commanded not to fear at least 365 times throughout the entire Word of God. We are overcomers. We are courageous. But do you see here that the cowardly will not inherit the kingdom of God? We're called to stand for righteousness. And we do this with a broken heart and in love and with the grace of God helping us. But when there are things that are happening that are anti-Christ, that are not Christ-like, the very best thing that you and I can do is to tell the truth. You are loving their soul, not hating their soul for someone who is trapped in a worldly ideology. Colossians 2.8 says, do not be taken captive by philosophies of the world. And that is talking to the church. Do you see how dangerous this world can be? that false ideologies, false gospels can get into the church and take Christians captive and therefore we would not be able to share the true living gospel. But that is a characteristic of something that is not of Christ. And so do not take on the ways of the world. James 4.4 4 says friendship with the world is to be an enemy of God. And so to be able to share the truth and to truly care is to be courageous courageous Christians go to heaven cowardly people do not have this attribute and in fact the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the immoral persons and the sorcerers and the idolaters and the liars all of these will be in the lake of fire and so you have to sit back and say to yourself what am I am I an overcomer Am, am I truly able to identify the heresies in this world or am I given to them? Am, am, am I like the thief on the left or the thief on the right? Who am I? Am I repentant? Am, am I overcoming? Am I acknowledging my sin and, and acknowledging his sinlessness? Am I all about myself? Folks, I'm telling you, paradise is for the overcomers. So this world, it's, it's getting more and more like it's in the days of Noah. Would you agree? Yes. Matthew chapter 24, verse 37 is getting closer and closer and closer as you think, see things wrapping the globe that are united in an antichrist movement. We are getting very close to God's impending rapture. He's going to rapture the church. He's going to then pour out his judgment upon this world. Everything that you see as you read through the book of Revelation is going to happen without the church here. God's going to pour out his wrath upon the unbelievers so as to stir up 
the flames, bring the heat and bring them to repentance so that those who would be saved will be saved. He's going to pour out his sealed judgments of war and famine and death and martyrdom. Yes, good people who come to Christ in the tribulational times will be martyred as a testimony for the rest of those to see the courageousness of themselves. And then he's going to pour out the trumpet judgments where the earth is plagued. And not only the earth where the land is, but the sea as well will be plagued. And the rivers will be plagued. And then after the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments, there will be the bowl judgments where humans will suffer horrifically. You can combine all the horror flicks and movies that you've ever seen and it will not come close to the book of Revelation and what the people will be suffering. And all of this is to force mankind to repent. Those who will repent will repent through horrific sores, through the scorching heat of the sun, and then darkness which will prevail. Now, once the tribulational times are over, Christ will return for a second time and absolutely annihilate every bit of rebellion that's left. Satan, he's going to be sentenced to the lake of fire for eternity. Eternal damnation and the lake of fire are synonymous concepts. The great white throne judgment is great because of how many people are going to be judged and how pure it is refers to the whiteness, the holiness of God. God is making all things pure. His holiness demands a righteous judgment. So the great white judgment, the great white throne judgment will happen at this time. World history is going to come to a close. Time will end. There will be no longer any time. You think to yourself, for the criminal who is going to go before a judge, all of a sudden, when he is being sentenced, time seems to stand still. Well, there is no time at this judgment. We've got all of eternity to sit through and to have our thoughts and our motives and our deeds judged by an eternal God. There's no time. Time is done. We're in the eternal state. And now, for those who are saved, they will be with Christ, headed towards the marriage supper of the Lamb, headed towards paradise. Revelation 21 depicts what it's like at about this moment. We will all know, Revelation 20, 15, it says, anyone whose name was not found in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. That's what we're all going to be thinking about. That's what we're going to know. And so, think about it. Jesus uses one of his last dying breaths to push himself up and to say today you will be with me in paradise one of these last painful words he says paradise we should think about paradise about heaven and if you would see paradise and not see hell for eternity you must follow the example of the repentant thief you're not promised tomorrow I'm going to give you point number one. You must fear God. The repentant thief feared God. And in Luke chapter 23 and verse 40, we see this. Verse 40, but the other answered, this being the repentant thief, and rebuking him. You see that he rebuked the unrepentant thief. He said, do you not even fear God? Do you not even fear God? If, if you have not repented of your sin, you do not fear God. But if you understand that God holds the keys of life and death in his hands and the book of Revelation is real and heaven is real and heaven is real, then you will start to fear God. You, you, will, you will repent. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God, Proverbs 14, 1 says. You must fear God. So much so that it will scare the sin out of you. Yeah, right? If you fear God and you understand who he really is, you will tremble before him and you will fear sinning and you will walk circumspectly, the King James says, or 
carefully. You will watch your tongue. You will hold your tongue. You will think before you speak. You will look before you step. You will think your day through to make sure I'm not going to react to the world here, right? Do not love the world or anything in the world. 1 John 2, 15. You're going to make sure that you are in alignment with a holy God because you fear him. Saved people fear God and they run from evil. Romans 12, 19 says, hate evil and cling to what is good. And the old reformer Jonathan Edwards used this word picture, this metaphor that you just cannot forget. We're nothing but sinful, little, ugly, nasty spiders. And if you imagine a spider hanging from a thread over a fire and he, that spider is trying to crawl up that single strand to avoid being burned to death, that strand, the only hope that we have is Jesus, but we are just mere little, nasty, ugly, little, wretched spiders. And you're trying to flee from evil and flee from hellish things and doctrines that are straight out of the pit of hell. There are so many things that we are faced with today that not only are straight out of the pit of hell, doctrines of demons, but we have things that are parading as angels of light, and it is difficult to discern. I'm telling you right now, if you are not a member of a good Bible preaching, doctrinally sound church, then you will be like that coal that's separated from the fire and start to extinguish. You go out. You won't be able to discern it takes community, it takes a church, it takes all of the gifts of God working together to be able to create a full biblical worldview, to be safe in Christ. You can't do it alone. God didn't design you to be able to do it alone. We need one another. That's just the way it is. I need you and you need me and we need each other. That's just the way it is. That's the way God has created us to be. And we will eschew evil and run from it and hate it and cling to what is good if we fear God. Not only that, but you need, need also to confess your sinfulness. In verse 41, notice how the thief did this. And we indeed are suffering justly for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. And when you recognize the fact that our deeds deserve damnation, they deserve hell, then you recognize your sinfulness. You recognize that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. There's nothing glorious about us anyway. Our righteousness is a filthy rags. Sinners must recognize their total depravity, their wickedness, their fallenness, their unholy state, and how it deserves God's wrath because he is thrice holy, holy, holy. Ephesians 2, 2 says this. It states that Christians were formerly walking according to the ways of the world as sons of disobedience, living in lust, indulging in the flesh, and were by nature children of wrath. Do you get that? It's not just thieves and murderers that are children of wrath. It's the cutest little precious girl that's been born into this world who seems to have done nothing wrong and could do no wrong. We are all born into a sin-depraved world. And through sin, through the sin of Adam, his prosperity, we, posterity, we, we have inherited this sin disease. And so that makes us children of wrath or estranged from God. And without Christ saving us, we will experience God's wrath. So the thief, he said, I deserve to die because of my sin. He admitted that. He recognized his sinfulness. But God stepped in when he said, remember me. Ephesians 2, 4 to 5 says, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love for which he had loved us, even while we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. Hey, listen, if you're going to avoid destruction and see heaven, you've got to believe in Jesus' deity. Number three, you must believe in Jesus' deity. Colossians 2, 9 says, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. All of God dwells in Jesus Christ. So only Christ has all of the deity. That's the reason why he was the substitutionary 
replacement for you. He, he, he took on your sins. He was able, you're not able, we recognize that. And you must believe in his deity. You see, you could never live long enough to suffer long enough on the cross to pay for all of the sins that you've ever done because you're not righteous. You never were. You, 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 would have, you would never be able to make enough money to pay back your sin debt. It's impossible. You're in an, you are in an impossible situation. But with God, all things are possible. Amen? God can do it. With God. Not with yourself. Not by works. But by God. By God's grace. And so we need to look to a, a sinless man named Jesus Christ who is able to save people like the blind men, the Pharisees, and turn a Saul into Paul, to save Nicodemus and the Ethiopian eunuch, to save the woman at the well, to save a dozen dull fishermen. Anyone else who would come to Christ must recognize that they are a sinner in need of a savior. They must believe in Jesus' deity. They must believe that Jesus is God and nothing that God wants done will be stopped. And so for those of you who would repent, then God knew it before you would repent. You must call on God, but Christ must also call on you. Point number four is that you must call on Christ, but you would have already been called on by Christ. And so you must also not only call on Christ, but you must be called by Christ. So if you're to call out by Christ, then Christ would have already been calling to you. Romans 8.30 says, those whom he predestined, he called, and these whom he called, he justified. This happened before the foundation of the world. But then on our side, Romans 10.30, whoever will call, on the name of the Lord, will be saved. That dual call is in our court. But just make sure that you're not calling from the wrong place. In Luke chapter 16, verses 23 to 31, we see a, a bad situation here. Luke chapter 16, turn if you would, to verse 23 and following. You're going to see a testimony here and an indictment and a fixed chasm in between Hades and paradise that still exists today. Once you die, it's fixed. It's done. There's nothing else that you can do. The repentant thief on the cross, he repented and believed in time. The unrepentant thief on the other side, He's in this regretful situation here. Luke 16, 23. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. And he saw Abraham a far way off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out, and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, so that he may dip his tongue in his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. Do any of you think that that's figurative? Boy, I don't. This is literal. Verse 25, but Abraham said, child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. For now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. And besides, all this being between us and you there is a great chasm fixed. It's done. It's forever completed. When you take your last breath, it's done. It's already decided. You're going to heaven or you're going to hell. The only thing left to do is to be sentenced to the extremity of hell because there are layers of torment in the lake of fire. And so for those who have reviled Christ, like you see on the cross happening, there is a hotter hell for those like him and Hitler, right? That's the only thing left, but it's done. And no matter how much you want your thirst to be quenched or to get out of the flames, it's done. And you will forever be regretful. In fact, you may even be turned into an evangelist like you'll see in the rest of this text so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able and that none may cross over from there to us. Verse 27, and he said, then I beg you, Father, 
that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers in order that he may warn them that they will not come also to this place of torment. Oh, now he's going to evangelize, right? Well, too late. By the way, Christians are overcomers. Have I said that yet? Sometimes evangelizing is difficult. You have to overcome the fear of getting that conversation going, but those who do overcome that experience the power of the Holy Spirit, enabling them to say what needs to be said, and the gospel seed can be planted into someone's heart, I would encourage you to be an overcomer now and so prove that you are disciples of Jesus Christ because if by chance you are not a true believer, you don't want to find out the hard way and become an evangelist in hell. Verse 29, but Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear from them. That's where we are today. If you write in your Bible, put here and now because it's done. And what the prophets have said is right here. They have this. The prophets speak still. We have the word of God and that is what's left for us. So, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So we must share the word of God. We must evangelize. We must let those who don't know, know. God works through the evangelist. And so in conclusion, for us here and now, be reconciled to Christ. 2 Corinthians in chapter 5, verses 15 to 21, plead for us to be reconciled to Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'll read it to you. Verses 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. And now all things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry. You see the ministry that we have here, right? You who are saved had a, have a ministry of reconciliation. And so those who are far away from God, it's your ministry to reach them. Jesus was the light of the world and now he has passed the torch to you. You are the light of the world, okay? These are simple concepts, but I don't see Christians taking it seriously. I don't see Christians taking the destination of lost souls across the street seriously. We must evangelize. Perhaps we're not evangelizing because maybe we're not saved. Maybe we do not have the unction inside of her because we do not have the unctioner inside of us. Maybe we don't have that oughtness in us. Maybe we don't have a, a river flowing out because the river's not there. We have a ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, namely that God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we may become the righteousness of God. Be reconciled to Christ. So, false converts, they have a false sense of security. We gotta get through to that. But true believers who have a new nature according to this text are unashamed of the gospel. False converts, they, they never share their faith because they don't have it. They simply do not have it. We're living in a day and age where false converts are religiously attending a lot of our churches. True Christians do more than attend and give, okay? True believers study the word of God. They long to love others because of the love that is inside of them from God. They long to worship and to sing because God's praise is due his name. If they don't show up, there is guilt that shows inside of their soul. And they can't stand that. True believers, they study the word of God. They long to know the word of God. But false believers, they ignore the word of God. 
Hey, true believers, they're happy to sacrifice. Have you noticed that? But unbelievers absolutely get honorary when they're required to sacrifice anything. True believers, they put others first. They serve first. False converts, they serve themselves. They're concerned about their preferences. If they're comfortable, they're happy. If they're uncomfortable, they're unhappy. But believers, if they're uncomfortable for Christ, they're happy. You get that, right? And so we put ourselves out for the sake of Christ. It's the whole picture of the New Testament when Paul is going to these places and suffering all of the stones and all the mocking and all of the beatings that he went through. It's the disciples, like we've been shared with already, who were martyred for the cause. They did not recant their faith. It's the example that Christ said for us. Philippians 1, there's a promise there. Those who live in God are going to suffer. It's what we do. It's who we are. And Christ fills us back up again as soon as we head down that suffering road. So true believers, they live by grace. They're prayerful and they're humble. But false converts, they just simply grumble. Israel was our example to make sure that we're not grumblers. And so in conclusion, I say that the thief was reconciled, but so can you. You can be reconciled. Be reconciled to Christ. Perhaps through repentance and faith, and perhaps by studying his word, you can be reconciled. Perhaps those who have been estranged from Christ but are already saved need to make a new commitment to studying God's word. But perhaps if you have never repented, you need to be saved, you can be reconciled to Christ. And so now, through this invitation, I pray that you pray with me and plead with God. God, I want to be reconciled. God, bring me closer to you. I draw nigh unto you right now. Will you draw nigh right back? That's a promise out of James chapter 4 verse 8. And if you're not walking closely to God, but you're already saved, praise God, draw closer to him. But if you are unsaved, call out to his glorious name. Pray with me if you would. Father, for anyone here, who needs to be reconciled to God like the thief on the cross was, I pray that you would help their soul by convicting it. And God, I pray that you would help their mind by illuminating the truth of this text to them. And God, I pray that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would draw them closer to you. And if anyone here has never repented of their sin, may they call out to you and say, God, forgive Give me of my sin. I see that you saved the thief on the cross and I want to say as well that I deserve death. But Lord, have mercy on me. Reconcile me. Save me, dear God. Lord, the word of God has been preached today and it's been made clear through the power of the gospel that we cannot be saved on our own. And so a dual invitation here, Lord. Two thoughts permeate for those who are like the thief who is unrepentant. May they repent and call out to you for salvation. Draw them by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. And then for those of us who are already saved but are living for ourselves, perhaps maybe they are not saved and need to repent but as well for those who are saved to walk closely and more dedicated to you God this is an internal thing not an external thing it doesn't matter how many times we show up to church but it matters why we show up to church and why we're coming it matters what we do at home and why we do it and you know all of these secret things thank you Father for your omniscience and knowing everything and we pray for your omnipotence, your power to save those who are lost and to reconcile them and to draw the saved even closer into a more sanctified way of living. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.